And now, Spotlight Montana with Laurel Staples. B.J. Wirth is a legendary figure in skydiving, and it all started at the University of Montana in Missoula. From the silver tip skydivers to his unforgettable death-defying stunts in the popular James Bond movies and many others. In the spotlight, Montana, the Whitefish native, talks about everything from his phenomenal skydiving career to his current work in bird conservation research and film production. First, when did your interest in skydiving start it was at a young age right when i was a kid I, I don't know maybe 14 years old i read an article in a kid's magazine at a doctor's office or something and it was a story of somebody that wanted to make a parachute jump in the in the late 50s early 60s or i guess early 60s and they went through three months of training and learning to pack the chute and finally jumped and he got drug across the field through a fence and all this stuff. But at the end of the day, it was worth it. And he just, you know, raved about it. And I thought, wow, how cool. Maybe I could do that someday. And then I watched an exhibition maybe within the year of uh, some U.S. Army's Golden Knights making an exhibition jump down in uh, Oklahoma. And so when they landed, I just, I, I'm very shy kind of guy, but I went up to one of these guys and he must have been 10 feet tall. And I just said, you know, where, where's your ripcord? And he pointed to something, which was really the housing, not the ripcord now, I realize. But it was the U.S. Army's very best at the time. And they just were so impressive. And they landed in circles with their accuracy. And they didn't have fancy parachutes. And so I always wanted to try it. And I didn't know how I'd ever do it. And I was going to high school in Southern California which is where the Mecca of skydiving was, but I didn't know it. And so I had lived up here with my parents off and on in Montana, nine different towns and a lot in Northwest Montana, they were on the ski patrol in the sixties, early sixties in Whitefish. And so, and then later in Red Lodge. So I knew Montana and I've been to Glacier Park a lot. So I was kind of attracted to this area. And I noticed in the college catalogs that they had skydiving offered as an extracurricular activity at U of M. So instead of going to Dartmouth like my father, my uncle, and my grandfather, I broke the family tradition and came to Missoula. And I, I only wanted to make one jump, and I was ready to put in my three months of training to do this. And uh, the first, when I got here, the first thing I asked anybody, I showed up with, you know, just by myself, I asked someone, where do you learn how to skydive? And they, uh, they said, well, at the university, you'll ha they'll have tables in there and the people they'll be recruiting students. So I went and sure enough, I found a table and they were recruiting students, but it was gonna cost $50. So I didn't have $50 at 18 years old. So I waited till the next semester in January of 70 and my parents had given me money for books. So instead of buying books, I saved the $50 and went out and made my first jump. I love it. And you were a part of forming the Silvertip Skydivers, right, at the University of Montana? I was involved. The people that really formed the Silvertips are the smoke jumpers that probably started seven or eight years before. And so some of the, all my instructors were more in the group that started it maybe a decade before. But the group that came in with me was Andrew and uh, Larry and Karna. We had about 15 of 16 of us that were real tight, almost like a family. And we all started within one or two years of each other. And we helped take it from a, uh, a sleepy little club to a very active club. It was maybe as much social as it was skydiving, but we improved the skydiving skills. We had, I don't know if you heard, we had a, a plane accident back then and our skydiving plane uh, went down and killed everybody. So we, uh, in November of 70, uh, no, in November. And so anyway, we got our funds back together and it really kind of even brought us together tighter as a group. And uh, we got a new airplane, pinned it right like a Easter egg. So no one would miss it again in the sky. And we carried on. And uh, so young kid, I didn't know much. I wasn't around death or anything like that. And the sport has that element. But for all of us, we were enjoying it so much doing things that gave us self-confidence. We were like a big family. And at the end of the day, 
we spend as much time together uh, playing, uh, drinking, telling stories about what we did for the day. And so socially, the skydiving club, the, the silver tips, kept us together, brought us together, kept us together. And it's interesting after all these years, how our lives are still intertwined and braided together. And we're still close friends. A lot of us, we don't see each other sometimes for a little bit or whatever, but we're still real close friends. And those are some of our better memories. Yeah, an incredible friendship bond there, sounds like. Uh, oh, yeah. So from the University of Montana, after you left the university, things changed in a big way for you, right? <laughs> well, when I graduated, uh, from school and my degree was in zoology, I thought, well, do I want to be a uh, forest ranger or something or running a zoo or running or operating, working in a zoo, which would have been fun. But before I did something responsible, I wanted to go play. And so I said, well, I'll work, I'll play until I'm for 10 years and then I'll work until I'm 75. And so I went to where the Mecca of skydiving was, which was Arizona. Uh, at that day, and the world champions were there in the nanescent making formation skydivings. We're just making formations in free fall where they were. And these were the famous people in our sport. And we we're real lucky because the sport was just coming out of military sport and accuracy jumping to having fun in free fall, holding hands with each other, which we did quite a bit in Missoula. And the, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to see how far I could go and play. And the current leading edge of the wave was in Arizona. So I went down there in late 73 and uh, the spring of 74 and just had the time of my life. We were doing, there were three or four groups that were doing the same thing. A group from Seattle and from uh, Kansas and Texas and then individuals from other places. And we were trying new things every day that had never been done. And a lot of times it worked and sometimes it didn't, but it didn't matter because we were pushing that envelope and it was a fun time to be in a sport because today you couldn't do it. Everything's been done. Not quite, but you couldn't just start out and do new things that had never been done before. And we had such a good time. I wrote to one of my friends up here, uh, Gary Sanders, um, name is Hod. And he eventually was in the Navy and came back to Missoula and ran an operation, a skydiving operation in Ronan for years. But I wrote back to Hod and said, look, if you ever really want to skydive, this is the place to come. And I have to admit, I think he quit school and never finished and came to Arizona. But he, he was one of our better skydivers. And when he got down there, he fit right in immediately. He was a real natural talent. He didn't understand why anybody would make a mistake. And he ended up being on the competition teams we did and, uh, and several other friends kind of were part of that. But what we did in Arizona is this group of people from around the country that were trying to push the envelope, we made a little film to show the whole skydiving world what was possible. And we were just shooting 16 millimeter at the time. Video hadn't been invented yet. And... We took those videos and took it to a world championship in Germany and showed the skydiving world what was possible, making all sorts of different shaped geometric formations. And it was probably the most incredible experience for all of us because we were able to share with the world. And then from there, all the people at the world championship went back to their drop zones in their countries. And it's never been the same since. It's really fun to have been able to be part of such a fun experience. And it sounds like a movie producer somewhere in this timeline uh, reached out to you. Well, the fun we did in sharing with the sport, got the sport going in a fun way. We started competing and helped, I actually helped write the rules for the current competition back in 75. We won a few world championships. And in the meantime, the producers of the James Bond films, Michael Wilson, executive producer, he came to me and said they had an interesting idea. And I was currently the captain of the US team, world champions. And my partner, Randy DeLuca, was a photographer of our team. And he says, I've got this idea that I want to have Bond thrown out of an airplane without a parachute and uh, have a big fight scene. And at the end of the day, Bond takes the parachute away from the pilot. And you know that's a Bond story. And it's the beginning uh, sequence for the film. 
and he contacted us because we had a lot of experience in that in the world that day we had never done anything like this i'd done one commercial uh a couple of years before but we got some of our talented friends together the captain of the canadian team was uh just north of us up in lethbridge and so we got him to come down to design the chute because he's a very good rigger so he designed these hidden parachutes uh for us and we made some test jumps and brought them down to show cubby broccoli the producer of the bonds and they said okay we're going to let you have five weeks of shooting we want you to do this but if you don't have something good enough for us we've got to have enough time before principal photography starts to do our sequence that does work because he thought it was crazy but is michael wilson his is his stepson wanted this idea that he was executive producer and his stepson so he said okay michael i'll give you five weeks and we had the editor come from england and he set up shop and was editing so we would shoot a sequence a, a, a clip and then he would edit it into the from the storyboard and if something worked a little bit differently than we planned he would just say okay we need this shot as a filler shot so with our editor actually on the uh, set with us instead of waiting normally that he's in a back room somewhere when principal photography starts but he was available so he directed us he was our second unit director and we did the sequence in moonraker it was a huge success and uh, it was fun we got to go to the premiere and uh, watching all of our colleagues stand up and cheer when that happened during the premiere. Uh, it was a real fun experience for us. Michael Wilson is now the producer of the Bond films along with his uh, stepsister and I was happy and that relationship with that family that produces the films allowed me to get involved with nine different sequences on seven James Bond films. So that was a great experience. So it really went on to, uh, it was um, what led to other movies, as you mentioned. But I watched the scene again last night. It is so incredible to watch. It really upped the standard, I think, in free fall, right? Well, it, it did. And we, the hidden parachutes we had made it look a little bit more believable instead of a big lump on our backpack. And we took our skydiving skills that we had developed down in Arizona and applied it to the film. And we had enough time to do it right. And we had real good direction from John Glenn, who was the editor, second unit director. And it really did. And what we, we also got to do is we did it for real. We used most of the scene that we shot in, our, in California they use in the film and very few shots like CGI or blue screen shots of the actors. And that today would never happen. They would never do this today because they wouldn't do it for real. They would use CGI and have a nice background and we couldn't do it for real. And so what we brought to the table at the time, which wasn't being done, was something really extraordinary and done for real. Well, and as you mentioned earlier, went on to other James Bond movies as well, the um, View to Kill, that death-defying scene there from the Eiffel Tower. Tell me about that. Um, base jumping was just in its infancy when uh, we did Moonraker. But uh, we were doing the editing in the Bois de Bologna studios in Paris, by chance. There was a col collaboration between the Brits and the French on the uh, post-production on the and so one time at lunch and it was ironic that i was with all the stars i mean roger moore and the director and the editor and everybody was in this meeting and i said well you know uh if you want us to do some if you want to do something really fun in the future i'd love to jump off that eiffel tower for you and they laughed and they said well could you get permission and i said not a chance but you guys could and they laughed and uh, nothing was said again and we did the next uh bond film uh it was called octopussy and they we didn't talk about it again and then after octopussy was done i got a call from michael wilson and he said you know you mentioned about jumping off the eiffel tower do you still want to do that and i thought well sure uh no problem but now of course when it's real i never thought it would happen and so now i get a little bit nervous and he says, well, we'd like you to go to Paris, check it out and see if it can be done safely. So I went off to Paris and I, I don't know, if everybody knows much about Paris, but it's near the Trocadero. It's a big fancy museum area. 
and there's a subway station near there. So I got out of the subway station and walked down around Trocadero and looked up at the tower. And then I had to lower my eyes about 45 degrees because I remember the tower being much taller until I was actually sort of telling them I would jump from it. It was much lower than I remember it. And I went up to the top in a windstorm, it was January, and it didn't look very far down. And so I had to figure out my big mouth, I mean, I, I didn't want to hurt myself, but I, and I knew it could be done, but I wasn't sure exactly what it would take. Long story short, I came back to the Flathead Valley, made 22 jumps from a hot air balloon, practicing, because I only had, I had to fall for three full seconds before I could open the parachute, and I only had 450 feet to work with. And I, you know, it was not very much time, and I thought I could get out over the grass, but I couldn't, and I had to make sure that what I was doing was going to be safe. And if the parachute on a base jump spins around, then you hit the girders and it's not good for anything. So uh, I promised my wife that I would make at least 10 jumps where the parachute opened straight facing away uh, before uh, I would actually do the stunt. And so we used a hot air balloon and we went up to 3,000 feet instead of 450 feet. So we had plenty of room in case it was a problem. And I would practice jumping and my father-in-law would be videotaping it with a little video camera. Uh, and it, this is 84 before base jumping was really a sport. And uh, we managed to make a lot of jumps. They brought me over to Paris. I had to line up in front of five police officers or different police departments in Paris to explain to them why it would work and show them the video. And they finally said yes. And so I went over and it was um, one of the most exhilarating things of my life. I knew we could do it, but I, I'm not a daredevil. I like to do stunts, but the idea of a stunt is to make it look dangerous, not to have it be dangerous. But the um, Eiffel Tower jump was one of those where if everything went wrong, there was no out. And so they gave us a nice room in the Hilton next door to the tower, and we'd, my wife and I could look out our window, at the, our bedroom window, and see the tower there looming. And, uh, you know, it was kind of calling for me. So I kind of had a little bit of interpretation, but uh, went up there the next day and they built a nice little platform on top. And uh, it's, there's a long story to it, but the first time I tried to jump, I got all ready. They got, got all the cameras going and they got, have to get up to speed. The cameras are going three times normal speed to make the free fall extend with slow motion. And they go camera one and they said speed, camera two speed, camera three, nothing. Camera four speed, camera three, camera three. And anyway, camera three locked up. And because of the high speed, the camera jammed. So they said, sorry, BJ, we're gonna have to take a break and reload all the cameras. And so my adrenaline was going, and it, then I sat down on the little platform, and I fell sound asleep. And it's not because I was cool, it was because the adrenaline stopped, and my body had been fighting the adrenaline naturally, and then I knocked, you know, I just was, sound, I didn't know, but 15 minutes later, they kind of woke me up and said, it's time to go. And then we went and it worked really well. And as I'm running off the uh, tower and they said, okay, action, I yelled, this one's for Cubby, for Cubby Broccoli, who was a producer for the Bond series and ran off and did my three seconds. And I knew when three seconds was because from the hot air balloon jumps, the wind noise in my ears got more and more intense. And if I tried to count, of course I would count too fast. So the wind noise got more and more. And at three seconds, I knew when to throw my little pilot chute and it opened up and then flew over and had to land uh, next to the Seine River to get the continuity to make the direction right. And uh, it was a real fun sequence also. And that was probably my most daring type of stunt, but it was really fun as well. And along with the James Bond movies, there's so many movies here that you appeared in and, and did stunts. It just goes on, Congo, Space Cowboys, the list goes on and on. It, um, which one, it, are there a couple there that you felt like, oh boy, this is not going as I had planned. Did you ever have some moments like that? There's a couple of films we've done where it was more challenging than we thought. Uh, one, one, one of the Bonds, uh, um, Golden Eye, I had to dive in free fall and catch an airplane in free fall and climb in. And the airplane had so much mass, I could never get to it. I'm standing on my head. 20, 30 feet away and the fumes are in my face, but I couldn't catch it. So we had to 
uh, get fairly creative in making that scene work. Uh, the right stuff, when we did that, I was doubling Chuck Yeager and he went to real high altitude try, in, during the Mercury program. And he was trying to get to space with a fixed wing aircraft and kind of looked down his nose a little bit, uh, it appeared in the movie anyway, at the astronauts who were spamming a can in the Mercury capsules. And he was trying to get up there anyway. He flew up and lost, uh, he got way high above 100,000 feet, but he lost the power in his engines and no air. And so the plane tumbled and he had to eject. So we went and I got in an ejection seat and they threw me out. But before I did it, we had another, one of our friends being the stunt man. And he ended up being killed doing the stunt. And it wasn't the stunts fault. It was a series of problems and things happened and he didn't have his glasses on. He couldn't see well and he didn't open his parachute in time. And so Chuck Yeager suggested it's too dangerous in the first place for him to do it. It was too dangerous to reenact it and we shouldn't do it. And I convinced the uh, director that it could be done safely. We would just take it one step at a time. And long story short, we ended up completing it and it worked really well. But some things like that, you have to be very careful and you have to know when to say no. If it's too dangerous and it's a few times it's been that way, the situation wasn't going to work. We just said stop and we'd come down and we'd land and we wouldn't do the stunt, and then we'd figure out a way to do it right or do a variation that would be safe, because after all, we want to come home and be with our family at night. The idea isn't to cheat death. The idea is to make a really fun film that everybody can watch. Mm -hmm. Well, I hear you're trying to retire. <laughs> <laughs> do, you still, um, do you still jump? And I know you're also pursuing another passion of yours, a lifelong passion and uh, um, let's talk about that as well. But do you still go out and jump? I still do jump. I, during the COVID years, I've been very conservative and staying at home, but I went out and jumped uh, this summer for a couple of jumps. And for uh, about 10 years, 12 years, my wife and I organized large formation world records, starting out with 200 people in, in a circle or a big formation. And we lifted it up until we set the world record with 400 people. So during that period, uh, we did that in 2006. And so I was jumping four, 500, three, 400 jumps a year through 2006, and now averaging maybe 150 jumps a year. Hmm, incredible. And, and do, you, do you have, um, is there an upcoming reunion uh, planned at all with the Silvertip Skydivers or um, events planned coming up? Uh, we have sort of a ski week with some of the silver tips every year. And I would love to get back together with as many people as possible. We haven't had an official reunion for a while. And the last one that happened, I wasn't able to be there. So anyway, I'm um, looking forward to all of us getting together. Uh, Andrew McFarland and I and a couple of people have talked about maybe actually going and jumping together, which would be fun because that's what started, brought us all together. And I'm hoping we can do that. And in the meantime, my passion from the University of Montana, I got my degree in zoology, and now I'm jumped on the other side of the camera and I'm filming birds and bird behavior and working on birding conservation uh, as much as possible. So that's really my passion now. And I get in the, with the skydivers now and then, but most of the time you'll find me out in the field traipsing around with a camera trying to film little birds. And you have a film production company, right? I do have a film production company, Big Sky Productions. It's a nice Montana name. And we've done about a, a dozen of our own small films uh, that for different reasons, for different purposes, the, probably the most enjoyable one, when uh, President uh, Bush uh, Sr. made his jump, he came out and made a jump. I was president of the U.S. Parachute Association at the time. So I invited him to come make a jump Never thought he would. And then Glenn Bangs, the uh, leader of our safety and training, who was a former member of the Golden Knights, invited him that same night when we saw him. And so he came out and made a jump. And I got all my Hollywood buddies together, and we got a plane in formation. So we filmed all of the, uh, his jump. The Teton, there was no news the next day. It was, we were really lucky. And so it was on newspapers all across the country. And uh, all the footage that I collected, I edited a film, or Big Sky Productions did, and we donated it 
to the Presidential Museum in Texas. And so it's there now. So that was one of the more enjoyable little films we've made here in Montana. All right. And you sent an incredible picture of that moment. And uh, uh, what, what a, an exciting experience that was for the president, uh, I'm sure. Um, so the Wings, it's called Wings in Nature, right? Wings in Nature is my birding nonprofit that I'm working with the people up here in Kalispell. And that is a, a little nonprofit to help bird conservation. And we're making videos using my video experience or filmmaking experience to make videos of the bird behavior and sharing it with everybody at no cost uh, for education purposes, entertainment purposes. So Wings in Nature is uh, just getting started and we're hoping to make a little documentary film about Harlequin ducks. And we have shot a little teaser about nine minutes long and everybody seems to like it and we're going to try to make a full documentary. Hopefully it will, I mean, Montana PBS, are you listening? Uh, and so we'd love to do something like that. They're great sea ducks that they live on the West Coast near uh, the uh, Strait of Georgia area in the Salish Sea. And then in the summer they come over to Western Montana and they raise their young here on the raging streams like in Glacier Park. And then they fly back and they spend the winter over on the coast. So they migrate east and west. They're really cool ducks. And it seems a little odd rather than jumping out of perfectly good airplanes to go chasing little birds. But I enjoy it and I get the same thrill out of both of them. What trends are you seeing out there with your research um, with the birds? The, the birds are way lower in numbers every year. The wildlife biologists I work with, they're not jumping to conclusions. They're trying to use the science to figure out what's causing it. With the harlequin ducks in particular, in the last 20 years, they've decreased by 2%. Their population has decreased by 2% a year for 20 years. And any one year might be about the same or a little bit less depending on local weather conditions. If the water rises too much in the creek where they're nesting, it's a problem. But overall, this decrease, they're trying to find out, the, the wildlife biologists up in Canada and the United States are working together, uh, trying to find out, and they're using different methods of satellite tracking and uh, e, uh, DNA, different methods to find out where the ducks are, what's causing, predate, is predation a problem, and what might be affecting the populations. And so I'm excited about showing the scientists, the wildlife biologists, what they're studying, the science they're using, and to try to help show what's going on with this. And they're not jumping to any negative conclusions. There's, of course, man-made problems that are causing problems as well, but they don't have a definitive answer on what's causing what issues. But they're working really hard, and they're, they are so dedicated to this project that I want to capture their dedication in the little film. So how do our listeners learn, uh, get more information on this, and, um, and then if they want to help out in some way? If they go to our website, wingsinnature.org, there's a story about our harlequin ducks, there's stories about the hawk watches that we monitor the hawks migrating through, uh, and that's really the best place. If, uh, and there's a place if anybody wants to make contribution, that would be great. Uh, and we are reaching out to the world and we're trying to show really good 4k video of as much behavior for behavior as possible and we're looking for input and for support and if anybody wants to come join our project we'd love it all right and in wrapping up um your thoughts as you look back on this phenomenal career well i've been very lucky i was active and going to school and starting the skydiving at the right time, the right place at the right time, and probably what kept me going, there's no doubt, the close camaraderie that was created in Missoula, going to school and with the silver tips in the early years, uh, without that, there's no way any of this would have happened. And I'm thrilled that I still see my friends, we still get together, even without jumping, going skiing, or just spending a night uh, telling lies. Uh, we have a great time, and that really is the the catalyst that began began this whole incredible career. 
thank you so much. And uh, yes, you have a phenomenal group of friends. And uh, um, this is just um, blows my mind looking at everything that you've done. And uh, um, uh, I wish you lots of luck in your research. And hopefully they can find what's going on with the decrease in the numbers. Well, thank you, Laurel. I really appreciate it. I appreciate this opportunity. And uh, it's been a lot of fun 